Hello and welcome to Hospitality Huddles and this week we are answering your questions. When I say we, I'm joined by Steve Turk of Turk Hospitality Ventures to answer the questions that you shared with us on LinkedIn. Anything that covers hotels, food and beverage, short-term rentals, we answered it and it was a great show. Last week on the Digital Hospitality Room with Sean Walshef and Cali Barbecue Media, we talked about digital receipts. And one of my comments that I said on the show was that I use this podcast as a way to record some of the amazing conversations I have with hospitality people so that you get as much benefit as I do. And this is one of those episodes that follows that exact principle. Listen to the amazing insights from Steve and myself on the answers to your questions. And without further ado, let's get straight into the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this question and answer session with myself and Steve. Great to be on another call with you, Steve. Oh, I love it. And I love that we get to go live today. And I love the promos yeah. you've been doing. Like, I like the engagement everyone's been sending us questions. So excited to answer those questions and hopefully engage live with you all watching now. 100%. And if you have questions that you'd like to ask uh, myself or Steve as the conversation flows, then don't forget to drop them down below. And we've had some really uh, interesting questions that we were we were chatting through before we came on air, Steve, right? That's exactly right. And we've been talking about them. Some of them really intense questions, some little softball ones. So I'm excited to get yeah. to them. Yeah, it'll be a good fun shot. So, um, Steve, for those people who might not have seen you before, which is probably unlikely, but just in case, why don't you tell people who you are and, and more about what you're doing? Yeah, I'll give you a 30 second download here. I'm a lifelong hospitality professional, now a hospitality entrepreneur, podcaster, a public speaker, and now hopefully to be soon author. So I'm dropping that here for you. So that's coming up awesome. soon. Um, but I love hospitality, love talking all things hospitality, own Turk Hospitality Ventures, where we do consulting and projects. We have Tangy Management, where it's a vacation rental company, and also a hospitality solutions company we can chat about. And I have the Hospitality Mentor Platform, where we talk to people like you and uh, all different kind of leaders throughout the hospitality industry. Yeah, some amazing stuff on there as well, and congratulations on doing a doing a book. That'll be uh, that'll be an awesome project. Yeah, it's been like a year in the works, so now I'm like confident enough. I've gotten further far enough along where I'm like, all right, this will actually happen. Exactly. Awesome. Well, let me, I'll tell you all the 30 seconds about me as well. My name's Scott. I'm the founder of Bond Hospitality based here in our HQ in London. We work with hoteliers to help them think differently about their F&B uh, to create outlets that they will love. Um, so we work with hoteliers in all different types of forms from projects and, and ground up situations to going into hotels that might not be performing where they need to and need a little bit of help. And uh, we've done some amazing projects with some great brands in uh, UK, Europe, uh, soon to be US and soon to be Asia, which is a great growth for us as well. But we obviously have the podcast that Steve was on uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we have a Substack newsletter, F&B Insider, um, and uh, yeah, a few other little projects in that I can't say right now, but we're working on some stuff very similar to what you've been doing as well, Steve. So yeah, really excited to, uh, to be here doing this today. I love it. I see. I love connecting with people that are just elevating hospitality. So that's what makes it so much fun. It's important, right? It's really important. Now, one thing that I love about this today is um, I'm working on a, a, a project right now, which is looking at the trends that have been happening in the UK and the US and how uh, the two are going side by side in terms of performance. So this is really exciting to be on uh, a Q&A with you today and uh, learning a little bit about what's happening over there in Miami and uh, giving a UK opinion on it as well. So um, it's really multinational. Yeah, that's what I like seeing. We've got two different countries across the pond here seeing what's going on in your neck of the woods. I asked you a question, which I'll ask later, uh, yeah. but I'm curious to see kind of what's trending, especially in restaurants over there. 100%. So should we dive into the first question? I think we should. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go for it. So uh, the first question was from Michael Gove, um, who's the CEO at Hotstats, the global benchmarking platform for, for hotels. So maybe he has a, uh, a delve into the data here to, to answer this, ask this question. But he said, do you think that many hotels could benefit from simply outsourcing their F&B? And interestingly, he says to Uber, Deliveroo, Just Eats uh, and DoorDash. Interesting question, right? 
Yes. Do you, do you want to tackle this one first? Well, I'll go with it first. I don't think that they should outsource it completely. Um, I think it should be an option for guests, but to take it a, a level further, when I was working in hotels, especially during the pandemic and through 2021, I was working at a hotel called the Lowe's Miami Beach Hotel, and I really wanted to create a menu that was not promoted anywhere in the hotel, but only on those deliver apps, right? I wanted it there. And we built out a menu that was all based off of stuff we already had in the hotel, right? So like we had a great burger in this kitchen. We had wings for the room service area. We had sushi in another place and we were able to create a menu and put it out there. The challenge we faced was as soon as we wanted to start, we had to figure out, do we want delivery people? Where are all these delivery people are going to be going? How are they going to pick up? And I got shut down, unfortunately, by my corporate office. They didn't want delivery people running around the hotel. But I think that that is a model that can be done. And I haven't seen anyone doing it yet um, yeah. that I've heard of. But I would love to see that part done because we do have some awesome things at hotels that should be promoted. And it could be that it's, oh, you know, Steve's Sushi. And you just don't know that it's coming from the hotel. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. We we had it a lot here in central London during the pandemic, um, and we had quite a, an, an upscale delivery platform here called Sucker. They had the uh, little trucks that had suspension in them so that the food didn't get banged around everywhere and they were heated. And some of the big brands were on it here, independent restaurant brands like Hackazan and things like that. And uh, a lot of the hotels went with it. We were working with Harrods at the time and Harrods um, were with that as well. And I think very similar to what you said, as it came out of the pandemic, and things started going back to normal. Delivery drivers turning up at hotel lobbies and things like that just didn't fly. Mm. Um, I just think, you know, look into the future. There's possibly an opportunity where if you look at some of the high street stores now, they're building separate uh, windows and entrances for delivery drivers because it's so important. Maybe there's something to be done around the loading bays or where the associate yep. entrances are and things like that that could really be where they can optimize that side of things uh, properly, couldn't they? And I think there's a real opportunity there. I think on, on my side on this one um, is really interesting. I think uh, it really depends on what type of hotel you are and what your demographic is and, and, and what they're looking for. But I think there's a real potentially, when I was thinking about this conversation, I was thinking, is there an opportunity where a, a big brand could maybe do a collaboration or a partnership with say Uber Eats where they start looking at offering kind of local heroes and it goes through that loading bay entrance, it goes through that special entrance and it's really a partnership whereby there's a revenue share and you're supporting local businesses as well and you can really have this kind of real community feel going on that offers guests lots of choice in an environment where maybe a room service menu might not be offered or a room service menu might be limited because of resource time and all the other things that would go into delivering room service i just think it's um yeah i, I think there's a really interesting thought point around whether you could actually make that a really viable option that guests would buy into yeah, I think that they would. Look, I see it all the time. I, mean, I had an 800 room resort that I was working at and I still work with other clients that are mega resorts. And I see the delivery drivers coming up to that front desk or meeting people out yeah. front all the time to deliver food. And so that's yeah. just a, a place that hotels are, are missing out on because yeah. that money is leaving the filters they have in place. That's how I kind of look at it. It's like you have filters throughout to catch people's money, but also to make sure they have a great time, but really to catch that dollar. And so when I see those delivery drivers, it's just like, man, we're, we're missing out on this opportunity to be able to offer this kind of service, right? And they don't know that it's coming from the hotel if we create a brand within mm -hmm. that's only back a house. So exactly. there's something there yeah. and I, I really hope people see it. I know that like C3 from SBE was trying it, you know, Sam Nazarian, but that's more yeah. of just like ghost kitchens and completely off the hotel. I would yeah. see it really like really work into that hotel menu. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. I think anything that can offer extra choice to a guest and can keep them in the building is obviously a, a huge advantage to the hotels, isn't it? So, um, yeah, really interesting one. So thanks, Michael, for, for that one. Um, uh, Chris Frawley, he said they have the best octopus there. So oh, hey, um, we'll take it. We'll take it here on South Beach, Chris. Anytime you want to come down, let us know. 100%.
Definitely. And Chris, if you have a question, uh, drop it in there. I know you're pretty frequent on some of Monty's live shows and things as well with, with stuff. So yeah, f- feel free to fire it in. Uh, the next question, Steve. So the next question is from Carl Wilder. And I had Carl on my um, on my podcast really right at the start. And um, it, uh, Carl... Uh, he's now based in, based in Berlin, but he's an American uh, by heart. And um, he's been curating food tours in different countries around the world uh, for kind of 25 years. So much knowledge about so many different places. And his question was, why do you find hotels are slow to adapt to change, especially in trends emerging outside of the industry? Look, I, I have my belief. I'm curious to see what yours is. So yeah. mine, yeah. just walking through hotels, like I've been doing something called the 50 hotel and 50 day challenge where I'm visiting 50 hotels and seeing something unique at each property. And along those tours, I get to meet a lot of people in those hotels, even though I'm going in there unannounced. And what I've found is that people want to do things differently. They want to change, but they just don't have the time or the staff mm-hmm. or the capacity to take on anything else. And so yeah. that's where they're just like, oh, I got to add something else. Is this really going to be a big return on my investment of time and stress to get it going? So I think short term, that's what's happening. So I think it's bigger pictures. Be leaders like us really helping hotels, restaurants to figure out ways to do it strategically and giving yeah. them the tools to be more efficient. Because right now, it's still sad to say a lot of people are short staffed and just kind of running around with a lot less layers than they had uh, four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that's so true. I think that time thing is a is a massive piece, isn't it? That's uh, that's that's hurting people. I I think on this one as well is I think um, you know sometimes I think as hoteliers I, I think I was a little bit like this when I was in hotels. I always looked within the industry, and I'm not sure I took as much notice outside of the industry as maybe I do now because of going on the journey with Auden as well. So I think maybe sometimes we, we look at competitors of other hotel comp sets and other hotels and forget a little bit about what we can bring from innovation from other areas. So I think there's a little bit of that. But again, I think back to your point of that time and effort, I think it, it, certainly in some of the bigger chains, I think there's, there's probably um, that much process that goes into an idea through to implementation that Mm -hmm. at times it can get lost within the chain of going up the command and back down so i i was looking at this and i was thinking okay let's let's look at potentially i'm a big scale brand maybe one of the big brands sitting out there what would be the process of getting this in as a as an idea so if you took any idea it might be uh so you'll you'll go out you'll do research because you're going to have to sell it into the people who are going to make decisions it probably then goes to decisions in operations in brand in marketing senior finance so there's all these stakeholders that sit there and then ultimately you have to create that idea to be scalable because in in these large chains scale is is the key to being able to deliver it across so there's brand consistency and things like that and then you have to pilot and then it'll go through all the processes that happen in pilots and then finally it might come to the implementation which then gets back to your t- thing of time. Is the resource there? Is the skill there? How do you roll out those training programs? So I think then you might hit legacy issues with legacy tech and things like that that can really impact. So I think even just on a quick five, 10 minutes, like let's really think about how you would implement something. There's so much process and probably so much time in terms of months and years that probably means by the time it actually gets in, it's not seen as being forward thinking and trend setting anymore because it's taken so long. And I think that's potentially some of the the challenges around some of the big brands that sit there today is it's okay having 5,000, 6,000 hotels, but to then roll that out and then to convince franchise owners and things like that, it can be quite a challenge for the poor guy who had the idea right at the start, <laughs> can't it? No, it's tough. Right? That's why I like to see that the hotels that are boutique hotels they have the power to really make changes quickly and test things out Mm. and then the big brands either end up copying them or buying them right yeah and that's when i see these changes are starting to happen especially with the big three of hilton marriott hyatt you know intercontinental they see people doing something unique oh i like you know this nomad hotel i like the graduate hotel i'm gonna buy those and add them to my 
portfolio because they're doing really unique things. So that's where I really push these smaller hotels to they're independent. You can make a huge difference. So try out some of these things. It's just getting yeah. them the tools. And I don't know about you, but I love I love using all the new AI tools that are coming out because maybe way more efficient. But then I talk to people in hotels and a lot of them aren't using any of them or testing them or even trying them out, which would save them hours and hours and hours of work and make their life more yeah. efficient. So anyhow, I just want people to try things out. Go out there and test something. Well, I, and that brings up an interesting point, doesn't it? In terms of, you know, like, I talk a lot about the message about how restaurateurs and hotel F and B guys think very different. And when you're in that independent restaurant field, you you're much more of a hustler, you're having to do things, you're having to test and iterate. And maybe because there isn't that process that slows things down, you you're testing too much and you're doing too much. But there's that whole thing of innovation, isn't there? That I think um if there was more emphasis on doing that at kind of ground level in some of the some of the hotel operations, actually you might find that even individual hotels just get pockets of innovation and setting the trend in their local area than maybe what happens now, which is very much brand standards and things are getting rolled out and, and that localization piece gets lost to an extent. Mm-hmm. It's true. That's true. I, I just I think that's the key for everybody. This question kind of really sparks it, and I see it as I walk the the mm-hmm. hotels. It's just, yeah, find some time, give something new a try, because you might surprise yourself. It might be something you become known yeah. for. Yeah, I um I did a, a talk last week for um twenty students at a university here in London, and it was about that they, they were doing entrepreneurship, but they all had a hospitality background, and it was what were the lessons that I'd learned in the first two years of doing Auden, and, and um, one of the one of the things that I put on there was embrace failure, but learn how to fail fast. So don't mm-hmm. sit on ego and don't sit on something thinking it's it'll work in a couple of months. It like fail fast and just move on, but. Don't be scared of that failure piece. And I think sometimes hotels, and, and I'm, I'm going to use myself as an example when I was in hotels, you start questioning what will the guest think? And you almost use that the guest as, a, as an excuse of, oh, maybe they won't like it because our regular guests won't like it and things like that. And actually, sometimes just trying and failing might actually show them that you're innovating and you're trying to do something. And if you have that relationship with them, it can help. So I think my message... Uh, following what you would say there is embrace failure and don't be scared to make mistakes and maybe take your guests on the journey with it and it was the worst that can happen yeah just try it in little places like what my favorite place to do it in resorts that i worked at was in the cafe or marketplace right yeah so if i had a new product whether it's a beverage or a food item or i don't know some kind of merchandise i would test it in that cafe see if people actually liked it if it sold and if it did all right great i'm gonna roll it out to the rest of the restaurants or the pool deck or the beach or whatever it might be so just test it in small places so then you never know what you're gonna get yeah 100 percent. um the next question um is uh, actually let's go to michelle moreno's because i think this might be a nice uh follow-on from that question which was Do you think our expectations on service standards have dropped with our fear of recruitment challenges well, I have a firm belief in this. I think that you have to hold everybody accountable on your team because if you don't, you're going to lose the stars on your team. The stars will leave because you're not holding the the people who are breaking the rules and not following the standards and showing up late and calling out sick because they've had 10 grandmothers die that year, right? Yeah. You're going to be stuck with those people. And so yeah. we, we walk this walk in our vacation rental company at Tangy where we have a big team and it's hard to find housekeepers and engineers and all these people that we need, but we go by our core values. And if you don't follow those core values, you're not the right person for the, that seat. Yeah. And so we go right person, right seat. And if they're not, we make a quick move. We hire fast, we fire fast. And I think that you have to have that mentality and you can't let recruitment scare you, right? Yeah. You might say, well, Steve, that's easy for you to say, like you're not in the hotel and I have to pick up their shift. I promise you, if you start doing this after that first quarter of doing it, it will make a difference because the team will realize like, all right, we're up to the standard. Our leader's holding us to that standard and the people that are weak links won't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, Michelle in particular, I've worked with Michelle a long time and she she was having this conversation with, uh, she works with a Michelin star restaurant here in in the UK, in, in London. And uh, she was having that conversation with some of the, se- of the senior leadership team was we have to retain that discipline because that's what's making 
like it necessar- that's what's making guests want to go elsewhere is because they used to get in the dis- they used to having the the skills they used to having the training they used to having the leadership the managers on the floor all of this discipline that's made hotels great over the years and if we let that slip because we're scared of the recruitment then we're, we're only to blame ourselves and we can't then go blaming the new generation or blaming the teams or the fact that we've low skill as the answer because it's us that have dropped our standards not them and i think um we we had a we had a great debate about this exact subject because i um you know i think so many times you hear about the new generation or the new workforce that they don't want to work they are lazy they're you know the so the divas and and all this type of thing and actually i think a lot of the time they just want a 50 50 balance now where maybe when when we were in hotels we were very subservient and it was just a different mentality and a different generation but i think now if you invest in the in your people you make it really clear what your values are and how you believe and more importantly then you stick to it i think you can have an amazing workforce because i don't, I, I don't know what you see over there in the U, in the us but certainly here no, we've never had such a creative workforce as we have before. So when we're looking at content strategy and Insta stories and TikTok, it's not going to the agencies anymore. We're asking our teams in house to do it because you know we found a, a bartender in one of our sites. He was getting two million views a video on TikTok, mm-hmm. and it was like, well, who are we to tell him how to do videos? Let's let's yep. use it. Let, let's embrace it. Let's help him. Let's set him up more. Let's get him the right equipment. Let's make more of it. Because if he has success, he's been done in the hotel and in the hotel bar, we can get him to name check, then we're going to see that flowing through. So I think it's it's one of those where it's about kind of keep those core values at heart, really look at how you can ingrain that into the team, but more importantly, look at how you can bring their values out in what you're doing as well and embrace that and, and use the skills that are sitting there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And also the other thing I was thinking about as you were talking is that the generation coming up now, and I'm very proud of them because I'm doing a lot of it mm-hmm. as well, is that there's so many options and ways to make money now. Yeah. Right. And so if I was coming up now, I would only want to work for the best. Why am I going to waste my time working for an organization that's terrible? I'm not learning. I'm not gaining anything. Yeah. And I could be doing something else and gaining yeah. skills that I could turn into money and value to others, whether it's online or multiple side gigs or, you know, like you said, this bartender who's getting 2 million views a post might say, hey, I'm going to create my own products and start selling them online. And all of a sudden he's got a merchandise program and he's going to make way more doing that than he is bartending at your bar. Right. And so there's things now that I think are just very creative um, that I'm learning so much from people that are coming up. You know, I still feel young, but uh, I'm getting up there a little bit. And so I'm learning from the people that are new and coming in the industry with new ideas and really testing out all the tools. Just like we're testing out this new tool today, live streaming on the resin stream, right? Exactly. You've got to keep testing and innovating, haven't you? It's so true. I mean, the person who told me how to do my my YouTube was my 13-year-old nephew. Because he was he was doing it on CapCut, he was taking free videos of uh, soccer stars and things, merging them together, putting them on YouTube, and his big thing all the time. When I first started posting on there, I was getting two views, one view or something, and he was getting eighty odd thousand, and I just couldn't I couldn't take the uh, I couldn't take the ribbon anymore. So I was like, okay, put your money where your mouth is and turn one of my videos into eighty thousand like you. It's just yeah. It, it's definitely one of those. Uh, it's definitely one of those points where it's about there's there's so much to learn from that workforce, and we have the experience that we can pass down as well. And I think that's what's great about hospitality is that there's so much opportunity for people to learn from each other. That it's um, it, it's just a great place to be from from that perspective. Yeah, part of the recruiting challenge too. Going back to Michelle's question is I don't know how what the I'm sure it's similar, just in pounds to dollars here, but some of these entry level roles, you're making forty thousand dollars, which mm. you can't live off of. I can make forty thousand dollars flipping things on eBay, right? Yeah. So I'd rather do that and have all the time to myself than yeah. go be stuck in a place that I'm getting yelled at every day. It's I'm not learning anything new. Mm. They're not doing things at the top of their mark. So yeah. that's the challenge now. It's what people I want people to realize. It's not that they're lazy. There's just other options. So you got to make yeah. it an option that people want. 
And that, that goes back to, to some of the bits that I talk about with, with clients and chefs in particular, is how can you get rid of some of those menial tasks now that maybe we would have done in in the past, if that's the right word to use, but let's look at kitchen, chopping onions, menial prep, things like that. The, the new generation is so creative. They, they used to living in short form, as we all are now. Those mundane, long tasks of just chopping onions just don't flow anymore. They don't see the they don't see the track and the timeline that gets them to where they want to be. So if you can outsource or you can get machines and you can get things to do that menial stuff that then gets your people to be more creative and more focused on where it counts. I think it's little things like that that are going to mean you don't have to compromise on your standards because you're going to be setting them by innovation and pushing people to do better so you know cook alongs or here's an ingredients here's a bag of ingredients one chef that we work with does this every monday with his team he brings in a bag and he's like okay that's the ingredients make me something that's going to go on the menu and he does it every monday with his team and i think it's that type of bit where you can really push your people and when they see that you're investing in them that i think the new generation will run through brick walls if you ignore them and it's a one-way transaction i think that's where we start having the issues with uh turnover and and that side of things um it's yeah. very, it's so interesting i love and, that uh, creativity i love it i love that creativity of that chef doing that because that's what people want it's like having it's like being an artist again let me take these yes. pieces let me come up with something and be proud of something i'm gonna put out yeah but i see like the I get a lot of hate for some people because I like the robotics coming into the back of the house. Front of the house, I'm not so sure yet, but back of the house, like Miso Robotics and, you know, those companies that are really creating things where they're doing all the prep work that will allow more time to be creative and to get with that chef and create those menu items and then have the robots do all the prepping. Same thing with robotic baristas. You can still have somebody talking, you and I, right? Mm -hmm. But I see it now. Some coffee shops here have these $60,000, $70,000 machines. Yeah where you just push a button and it comes out perfect every time. Yeah. You know, I think that is going to be more of the future of things like that, where we offer the creativity, we program the machine, it does it how the creative person wants it to get done. Yeah. But it's speeding up quick. All these tools are are coming fast. Yeah. Joe, it's funny. There's a a coffee brand here in the UK that's just, I think they're on like 10 locations now, mainly in the UK called Blank Street Coffee. Oh, yeah, they, York, that, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one, right? And and it's designed that it can be run on one barista. Yep. And when we first went into there uh, for the first time, we were chatting to the barista and uh, and she was chatting away and chatting away. And you, when you have this moment and you think, it, I don't think she's making the coffee. And it was like, okay. So we paid her on the side and we noticed that the machine was frothing the milk and it was dispensing the coffee. And we were chatting her about, to her about it and she went you know what every single time we offer the same coffee and the only thing we have to train people to do is how to do the latte up that's the only bit so you still get the coffee but the milk's perfectly frothed the coffee is at its perfect condition with the right extraction and all the rest of it and uh, the best thing about it is i get to talk to you while the machine's doing its thing and she was yeah. like, that's what we're all about. And I just think it's it's fascinating. Commercially, they have a model that's taken away probably the biggest, one of the biggest costs, which is labor. They're delivering a higher consistency of product because every time it's perfect. And the connection with the customer is increased because they've got more time to talk and less time to focus on on the yeah. machine. I just I think it's a really clever innovation. I love it. I was on a cruise ship and there was another robotic company called Maker Shaker. They're on the Royal Caribbean cruise ships with there's a whole bar of this robotic arm but I was excited to go see it. But I was like, man, this doesn't have like any kind of warmth. There was no connection to anybody. But then the next time I went, there was a person standing in front of it, welcoming you, handing you the drink, talking about how it sounds like that's that's the way it's going to work, just like we talked about. So I'm going to see Blank Street is making its way through London to go over a lot of places in New York. So I think it's going to do well. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really interesting. And I think just back to Michelle's question again, there was it was interesting. I had a conversation, I think it was on one of the podcast episodes, and um, there's, a, there's a restaurant group here called White Rabbit Group, and it has quite a few locations. And she was saying that one of the metrics that they've started looking at now from the people's side is retention in the industry and retention out, uh, sorry, turnover in the industry and turnover out of the industry now. And she said, when we have people going in the industry, maybe it's personal betterment maybe it's a change of scenery and all these things come up 
if people are leaving the industry, that's when they really start sitting with those people and going, why are you leaving the industry? What could we have done better? And she said she just sees that as a much bigger, a much better target for the people side is why are we losing people from the industry? Because we have to accept people will want to go to different jobs and, and, and all the rest of it. So I think I found that a really interesting metric that, that someone would, would look at, but it really makes sense as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I like that. I haven't thought about that. That's a good one to like measure and see how that's going. Yeah. So um, the next question uh, is from Rob Patterson. And uh, he said, you might know the place that he's talking about, which is Bistro Cafe in Miami. But his question was, why do hotel breakfasts often use powdered eggs and runny yogurt while many cafes serve visually pleased and exciting breakfast plates? Um, well, look, I, I cannot speak to the powdered eggs and runny yogurt because I would not allow that in my <laughs> departments or my restaurants. Uh, so maybe this is in some of those, you know, we stay lower tier hotels, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be allowed. That's something that should not be. And guests know that right away. They can sniff that out. You know, yes, there's some free breakfasts that you get, but I think you can yeah. elevate it in certain ways to make it feel or they're not just hanging you the yogurt from the grocery store and stuff that's been sitting out there for a long time it is you need creativity and you can bring things in from local bakeries like bistro cafe i'm familiar yeah. with it but there's a ton of great places just like in your city there's a great cafes and bakeries and thing chocolatiers yep. and specialties that you can bring in and create something that i will bet guests will pay a little bit of an upcharge for even if you're offering it for free yeah it's um it's a funny one isn't it breakfast because um yeah, I, I, one of the best things that that I thought when I left hotels was I don't have to do breakfast anymore because it was always that thing, start of the day and if breakfast went well, it was great. If breakfast didn't, it didn't matter how far up the chain you were, breakfast impacted your day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, you know, I think that some of this is um, is I think you know, as, if we're looking at breakfast inclusive. Some of the, I, I don't know what you guys are seeing now there, but we're seeing anything from six pounds through to 12 pounds 50 in the main. Sometimes there might be someone lucky gets 15 pounds. When you look at the costings, what does that actually deliver in profit? Chefs are on big targets for food costs. Yep. And naturally, the finance guy every month is giving you some stick about the food cost. Naturally, there's areas where it might be easier to to maybe lower quality or look at more efficient pricing than others. And I, um, especially in some of those, and and you know, it's probably around the the three star kind of lower four star properties. You know, some of the breakfast allocations that these guys are getting isn't easy, is it? Um, but I think in that situation, just look at whether quality is better than quantity in that yep. scenario and and really look at whether you can you know take a few items off and and start looking at where you can really focus on quality and i think um you know uh, one of the things i would encourage people to do we worked with a, a restaurant group in uh, the netherlands they have 19 hotels and they implemented uh, ai readers into their bins by their pot washes and what that could do it was it was so clever they could the they could tell because of the way the AI was programmed what was coming back from the buffet and what was coming back from a guest. So we did some breakfast development with them as part of the project and we could use this data to tell us how much the guest was wasting in yep. terms of the individual products and actually how much was coming back from the breakfast buffet on a at the end of a service and therefore what was being used and what wasn't being used by the guests which meant we could really focus in on the items that the guests enjoyed and in this situation what we actually did was we doubled down on them and we created a bigger selection of those items and it meant we could get rid of the stuff that people were never were never eating and i think there's certain bits like that back to your piece about tech where you can really start using some of the technology now on the market to really make your business more efficient and give you data that can help even on the smallest margins on breakfast become more efficient. That's true. I think you could also do some old school tricks so that I learned from back in the day is make sure you put all your carbs and breads up front and make it look plentiful so they fill up on that versus the expensive proteins. Yeah, right? There's like a lot of little old school things too, but I agree with you. The tech is very cool. And I think more and more of that will be implemented so we know exactly what's being consumed and we can measure it. I started seeing a lot of technology companies coming out of Israel that are now getting homes here in Miami. Yeah. 
that are doing a lot of back of house things like that, where you yeah. can have live food costs, like not live, like per day, like by hour and see like where you're at and you can get really into the numbers and see what's yeah. going on. So it's very cool. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, it, it, it is one of those, isn't it? I mean, it, it, I, I looked at it and it was like, is it down to, is it down to uh, volume? No, some of these cafes are doing just as big a volume as some of the hotels, you know, the staff should in theory be stronger in hotels because of what it is, you know, and, and it, therefore then it feels to me like that's a passion thing. And mm -hmm. is the chef really putting everything into that breakfast because it's almost like a service amenity type thing? And then it's down to the cost as well. So I think there's a few things there to to look at why. But I'm with you. I don't think any business should be using um, you know liquid eggs and powdered eggs and low grade yogurts and things like that. I just um, for me, if if that's where you're at, I think there's, there's yeah, don't even offer to tackle. It, it makes it worth it. You said definitely. Go with your Uber Eats this hookup, right? That we talked about earlier. Yeah, hundred percent. And then the perfect example, isn't it, of how of how that potentially is is a way forward. Or like you say, look at what local heroes you can bring in and and work with to again, like the room service example that can help take some of that pressure off your team and put great quality products back in. Um, uh, we we did a project recently that we do, that we using um, fresh from frozen. Uh, sorry, bits from frozen croissants, which were okay. There were nothing amazing. There were nothing outstanding. Um, and we went out and looked at a local baker who could do it for us. And it actually worked out about two or three P, so two or three, five, maybe five cents, six cents yeah. more. It's a no brainer uh, in terms of the guest. And guess what? The guest satisfaction now has gone up. There's comments about the croissants and it's all that knock on effect that has a, a huge impact, isn't it? Um, from the I agree. I think that's what it needs to be. If you can find something local, I love that. And plus yeah. the guests that don't have time to travel get a little taste of your city. Exactly. Hundred percent. I I also think as well is is that whole piece around um, you know, that breakfast is the last impression that you really truly have in your hotel because you have checkout and things, but um so make people want to go back because of the breakfast it's what you always went back to resort hotels and things like that for and then don't ignore the people who might just want a coffee and a croissant so having amazing pastries there and great coffee might yep. help you get some extra dollars through the till might it? i agree and if you need some coffee right over my shoulder we have biscayne coffee my coffee brand so you guys can buy there some coffee online at biscaynecoffee.com 100 percent. there we go perfect so tell us more about biscayne though because it's um, tell us more about the project because I I find this so cool. So you broke up there. What, what did you say? Sorry, uh, tell us more about Biscayne because um, I yeah, think Biscayne this is, coffee. Think so a cool project. This is what's uh, so much fun. Is yes, I'm a big coffee drinker. I'm drinking it right now. Is you know I came from hotel director of food and beverage. Started our vacation rental company. We were buying so much coffee from Starbucks, and I was like, man, we could be doing better than this called some of my friends that were roasting beans, worked for a year on a good three mixes and said, all right, we are going to start a coffee company. At the same time in my city, Biscayne Bay is a big waterfront here and it was very sick, a lot of fish dying. My kids started asking me what we could do. I say, you know what, we're going to donate 10% of all sales of this coffee to help Biscayne Bay and we're donating it to the foundation, the Biscayne Bay Foundation, not of profits, of sales, right? So it's a big number that we're donating. And it's just a fantastic thing. And since it's in our vacation rentals, people get to try it. And since they try it and like it, they end up buying it. And now I'm starting to send coffee all over the country. Can't send it international yet, but all over the U.S. coffee is going out. We're now in a big retirement community, which is shocking to me. They were opening a coffee shop ordered a lot of mm -hmm. coffee i went to the grand opening and it's all my coffee in that coffee shop so it's amazing to see how is this an idea <laughs> can grow um and i don't promote yeah. it all that much it's all just organic growth from being in the vacation rentals that's awesome brilliant so um and it's funny you should say that you know i i was told about two weeks ago that senior living is going to become one of the next big things in terms of kind of hospitality and trends and they were kind of saying to me that's where you should be focusing as well as what you're doing with hotels because there's huge yeah. opportunity of some of these because the generational wealth is now getting to that age they're looking for high-end places to live and within that they're building restaurants they're building prop speciality coffee houses and things like that and 
it's it's yeah this just backs it up i would tell you to do it and for listeners out there look i didn't know what to expect there's this place here i'll give them a shout out it's called john knox village it's one of the more premier retirement communities and a chef i worked with that was a michelin star chef all started starting working there i'm like what are you doing man what, what's happening and i went to visit him and it looked better than any resort i had been to like beautiful restaurants yep. beautiful cafes pool deck with like better than any pool deck i worked on and i said you know what this makes a lot of sense. These were very wealthy people that traveled the world, staying in the best hotels, and that's what they want in their you know, last couple of years, which is kind of weird to say, but yep. that's what it is. Yep. And so I encourage you to explore it, Scott. Yeah, 100%. So, Steve, I, uh, we've kind of hit- We've gone over here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I we've hit some of the, we've hit the questions that we wanted to to tackle today. Uh, if anyone's got any more questions, drop them in the comments below. But I I've got a question for you because we said we were going to ask each other a question, and you know one of the things that I've found really interesting recently is when I've been going to book on Booking dot com or looking at some of the some of the uh, third party sites, I've started to see short term rentals and apartments and flats coming up there, and. I went sh to Australia recently and we're going again next year. And because I've got two young kids, actually the short term rentals and the Airbnbs are probably a better proposition for me because they give greater flexibility. I can get a couple of rooms for the kids than going to hotels and it, and it pains me a little bit. I know obviously with tagging management, that's what you're focusing on. So if anyone's kind of been looking at that when they've seen it and gone, you know, what? I might have a, an apartment that I rent out and, and, you know, could I make more value on short term rentals? What what are the kind of the pros and cons of, of doing short term rentals? And then what are the tips you would give those people to kind of make it a successful business once they decide to do it? All right. So you're asking about the operators or the guests? The operators. So operators, this is what I will tell you. And I, I, I have a meeting today with a big property, but Miami has somehow become the epicenter of short-term rentals. They're building another 8,600 of them just in a three-mile radius of each other, mm -hmm. which is crazy. But everyone from South America is investing because it's the hot thing to do right now. If you were starting anywhere, do not get a studio. Do not get a one-bedroom because you're competing directly with hotels, right? So if you think that you're going to make a ton of money off your studio or one-bedroom, Maybe you could if you're in the right place, but you are automatically giving yourself competition, competing against hotels. Now, you go two bedrooms and bigger, and it goes. There's big homes, especially in cities that allow it, like Orlando, Florida, where Disney is, has like 12-bedroom homes. Yeah. But once you get into that two-bedroom mark, just like you, you've got kids, they go in the other room, you and your wife are in the other. You've got a living area, you've got a balcony, you may have a pool, you have all these things where you get to create your own experience. And sometimes that's yeah. what you want when you just want to get away and you don't want to go to a mega resort and be surrounded by people and fight over that pool chair and worry about waiting for breakfast at the yeah. line because it's full. So there's different ways that guests look at it. But as an operator, you, you, get, you buy Ikea furniture, you're going to get Ikea rates is what I tell people. People don't want yeah. cookie cutter, they want something a little bit different. Don't get too crazy on wild walls for Instagram and things like that. Try to keep it upscale and classy because that will last longer and you'll get a higher rate for that. There are a lot of people that do those things and they do well right now. I just don't know how long that will last. Um, so those would be my things. Right off the bat, make sure the size of your place. Do not do studios or one yeah. bedrooms would be my tip for you leaving today. It's a really good tip, though. Is I think I saw you you write that on LinkedIn actually, and it, and it's a really good tip, isn't it? Because it is that is where my my kind of USP is. I can go and it, it, both kids can have a bedroom each, and like you were saying, that flexibility is key. I can stay in and cook one night. We don't always have to go out if you've been, especially in places like Orlando. If you've been at the parks all day, you can just go home and get the kids to bed early, and then sit out on the balcony. So there's so many benefits of, of those short-term rentals isn't there and the fact that any kind of entrepreneur or anyone who's got that property sitting there can, can start. kind of get it listed it's it's perfect and where where does it come in i get uh, the next question from, from this would be where does it come in where having a management company can really make life easier in terms of whether that's the running of it, whether it's the marketing of it, like yeah. how does a management company make it easier than just putting it on Airbnb yourself and trying to... to yeah, and I think what's this. funny and what people don't realize is that 
how many questions people will ask you once your property is listed on Airbnb and VRBO and Booking and Hopper and all these places that you need to be on to be successful. One property, like right now, I, I see like a running, we have a, a program that we use called Guesty, so we can see that it's like an inbox, we see everything coming through. Each property is getting hundreds of messages a day. And so if you don't answer those things on time, you get hit by the algorithm for not answering those messages and you get dropped. So you just have to be mentally prepared. This is not, I know Airbnb likes to say, oh, it's the co-host and a part-time job. This is a full-time gig if you want to be someone who actually makes money, right? And so that is number one, how many messages come in? The other part is there's a lot of realtors that will get into this and people that are in that world and don't realize like, you're calling me because the toilet's broken at 11 o'clock at night or that the remote control doesn't work to the TV or they can't figure out how to open the gate to the house. Yes, this is hospitality. It's it's 24 hours a day. You're going to get those calls. You're going to have people go out, have a good time and forget how to use the code on the door and get locked out and call you multiple times. Like these are things that happen. Most of the time it's good. We come in there. You don't have to worry about the cleanliness of the place and things working and that's why people come to us is they get in over their head. They don't know how to manage the rates every day because they can't just be set and forget. So there's a lot of little things that happen for people, but I would tell you is it's a 24 hour day, seven day a week job. And when you don't have help, you're going to be answering those messages. And if you're not showing up, you're not going to get more bookings because the platforms will kick you up. Yeah. That's really good advice. Really good advice. It, it just listening to you then harks me back to the days of hotels. Uh, yeah, people don't get it. Like they're like, it says what's happening, and people are crazy too. You know, there's yeah. some people out there that just love to find what's wrong. You know that in the hotels, that's just yeah. their mindset. And you know, when you have that mindset, everything will be wrong. And so you just have to yeah. know how to handle those people and turn it around for the better. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. I hope that answers well, your the, question. Hundred percent. No, no, definitely. I think it's. Uh, I think it's. I, I'm seeing it quite a bit at the minute, and obviously the rise of Airbnb and stuff. So I think, you know, there's a lot of people listening to this that will that'll take a lot away from that, and a perfect tip on the two bedroom oh. and, and more. But one thing that's cool, you mentioned Orlando, a new resort just opened up called Evermore in Orlando, and they've kind of been doing this now with a Margaritaville, but now they're in mixing vacation rentals with hotels. So this place, Evermore, has mega homes on this beautiful new like lagoon they built. So it looks like you're at the, on a resort at a beach <laughs> connected to a hotel. And so you have the hotel experience all the way through. So you can stay in a hotel room or a mega home with all the amenities of a hotel. So people want to travel that way. It's going to continue. Yeah. Very clever. Very clever. I think, you know, and again, for these hotels and resorts, it's, an, it, it, it's just another angle that they can do when they're buying up some of these uh, huge complexes in, in terms of the diversion or diversity of, of revenue and, and what they can offer. Um, yep. It makes total sense. Well, my question for you, that was a good question yep. you had, but my question for you is, you know, I just went out and celebrated my birthday at a place called Lucky Strike, which is bowling, food, music, bar, arcade, a lot of things all in one. And I'm starting to see these things start to pop up in the United States more and more. Mm. But I know in London, you've had this going on for a while. I just started looking up and I see you have all these activity bars and restaurants. Is that something that is big and again, continue to trend? Do you think that will come over to the US? Because I just think that everything's so expensive now. I want to be able to also have some fun with friends Mm. and family when I go eat somewhere. Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know we we went through the food hall thing probably about just just coming out of COVID. Maybe even it started a little bit before. So so we've had um, the model where you have uh, a bar operator who owns the building and then leases out the the space to the independent operators. We've had that for quite some time. But the evolution out of COVID has been very much what we call here social entertainment, which is those type of. Uh, I guess it's the it's the elevated bowling alley that used to be around probably when we were kids. So here we've got all sorts. We've got Formula One. We have uh, cricket. There's a place called Sixes. They've got quite a few locations ar- ar- around the, the nation. We have uh, golf. We have darts. Uh, who else? This is testing my knowledge now. But we have we have quite a few of these kind of social entertainment things. And I think, um, you know, I, I spoke to a hotelier about whether um, he had a banqueting space that was in the basement. And it was in a really competitive area. 
he was always losing out to the comp set because he was the only one who didn't have natural light and it was in the basement and his product was a little bit tired. And we, I, I was having a conversation with him, not not necessarily um, as a thing, but going, do you know what, is there an opportunity where you could bring in some social entertainment, put it downstairs, create a different atmosphere and kind of go, okay, can I make as much out of that as I could out of banqueting? And it's actually like the point of difference for my hotel. And interestingly, when we were doing it, I um, saw that Nomad in New York has got a swingers downstairs. I think it's in their basement as well. And um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, hotels have got lots of retail space. They've got lots of real estate. And I just think there's a huge opportunity here where some of these great independents could come in. They can command decent rents because the the revenues are strong they have the the um the revenue from the gaming they have the revenue from the food the beverage uh, and everything else that goes with it and we um i work with a, a guy sometimes who works on virtual reality gaming with some of the big locations so he did the netflix experience in vegas he's done some formula one stuff in vegas as well um and he was saying to me he, there's a place here called gravity which is an indoor arena that has go-karting and it has some of the social entertainment stuff and and, and what have you and they were making about a million to 1.5 million a month in the first three months of opening just on the games alone that's so I think, you know, if you can get some of these brands in to your space and you can get a percentage of revenue, I think there's a there's a huge opportunity. But, um, you know, the other thing that's that's really starting to, to kick off here in hotels is uh, retail stores within the hotel lobbies and the hotel spaces. And there's a there's a company that's kind of nailing it right now, which is called Wondermat. And they um they basically it's a thirty, forty thousand minimum capex. You can obviously go higher than that based on your specs. Um they have a retail store in there. But what they do is again they fully service it. So you do you pay for the capex and then it's a revenue share model. They bring all the they fill it every night. They have vans going round. They have uh, an AI system that no, understands what's selling in your area, so they can fine tune what's selling. Um, and some of the big hotels, it's from like 150 rooms upwards. Some of the bigger hotels are making some serious cash within. Uh, the first few months and then the payback is roughly around six to nine months of this product <laughs> it's in hilton i think they've got them in a couple of marriott's they've now developed some brand standards with these guys so i think it's really interesting back to that room service com conversation we had right at the start That's it's right. actually you know that convenience and that point of difference for guests is really interesting and you know it's not serviced there's a there's a qr reader there like you would be in walmart on a self-serve checkout you scan your product and go even with the loss that you might get from some people not doing it you're still making tens of thousands of pro uh, 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 pounds of profit and i just think that's a really interesting model to look at right now in the right environment because it's space that's not being used that you're not looking after and with a little bit of capex and a really clear roi he's delivering some really strong results so i'm not sure if you have that there in the us but I yeah i would love to see it because there is it's very specialized at, at the my last hotel mm -hmm. you know I was, I was basically acting hotel manager of this giant resort and after the pandemic i was had food and beverage and recreation all of a sudden yeah. they're like you're in charge of retail too and we had like multiple retail stores like i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> yeah i've never done a retail learned on the fly but we had like very expensive products like dolce gabbana and you know yeah. all these products in there and this would have been something where i would say hey look let's go with somebody who knows what they're doing because yeah. like how am i going to inventory 1000 pieces of product in here right there was no good way of doing it there weren't the tools yet so I like that. I like think that a lot of hotels would do that really well. Yeah, and I just you know I look at some of the resorts and things like that that maybe outsource that type of thing as well. That you can now bring that in house and you can you can start controlling it and controlling how it looks. I think there's that. Yeah, I, I was really impressed with it with the guys and we're looking uh, together at how we might be able to evolve that into helping other things for like quicker quick grab and go breakfasts as a mm -hmm. so you'd have a uh, you know you'd have a, a bed and breakfast inclusive that was going in the restaurant for the full buffet. But if you might not actually want the full buffet, you want the coffee, the juice, and the croissant. 
how do we incorporate that so it's really easy for people to to do that process um and i think in the right hotel in the right environment that that could definitely help kind of generate some some good revenue for people so yeah i think the social entertainment one's a really interesting one i think hotels should start looking at it a lot more you know there's le petit chef as well which i don't know if you've seen i've seen that i've with them yeah the, the yeah. one with the mapping i think that's really clever so i think anything experiential that you can bring in um it's just got it's got that social media appeal it's got that mm-hmm. kind of engagement it's got that bit where people can start connecting and i think that's what hotels have always been great at is bringing people together for occasions and making them feel special and i think you know examples like le petit chef examples like um social entertainment i think is the new experiential way of what was maybe the geridon restaurant in the past uh that that kind of had the same thing we just didn't have the telephones to and, and the social media to promote it as much that's true. There's a guy in New York who's just, he called me for help. I didn't, I couldn't offer my help to him. He just wants to do board games. And so all of a sudden he just is bringing his group of board game professionals or people that just want to have fun playing board games to different hotel lobbies. And now it's a whole thing that they've got going on where they go like hotel yeah. lobby to hotel lobby, just playing old school board games. So Amazing. people want it. Hundred percent, and it, again, it's back to that piece, isn't it? About you know, how we were talking about from Carl's question about why uh, things not moving along. Sometimes that simple bit, sometimes just creating a point of difference that gives you that USP over other people can really get you ahead of the game and get give people a reason to come to your hotel. Which right now, a lot of people are probably going to coffee shops and restaurant, high street restaurants and things like that. But there's so much opportunity in hotels with the space. Um, it just, yeah, it's just there waiting to waiting to be seized upon. I like it. I like that it's working in London. That means it'll come over here pretty soon. I'm sure people will bring that idea soon. 100%. I think so. I think so. These guys should get some funding and bring it over because it's a great product. I'll send you I'll send you so you can see. I think... Uh, make that connection right now. We'll get them going. We'll make the connection. Let's go. Definitely. So, uh, Steve, that's it. For, let's just check the chat. Let's see if anyone else has, has dropped something in. No, nothing there. But um, we obviously, we had some brilliant questions. And as always, I, I love jumping on a call and, and chatting hotels with you because uh, you've got a very similar mindset to me when it when it comes to hotels and how great they can be and work that you're doing within them. And uh, so, yeah, it was brilliant being on the, on the Q&A with you. Well, I appreciate it. I can't believe an hour flew by this quickly. Uh, I always love talking to you about it. And I have one thing I do want to share with everybody is that if you're here in South Florida, July 10th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I'm hosting the Hospitality Mentor Networking Event for hotel professionals, restaurant professionals, vacation rental, and cruise professionals to get all in the same room because we always have different standalone events. I want to get everyone in hospitality together. Um, It's going to be at the beautiful Mayfair House Hotel and Garden in Coconut Grove, and you can get tickets online now at thehospitalitymentor.com. Awesome. And it looked a great event the last couple you've done as well. So the people should definitely be checking that out because it looks uh, it looks a fun night for sure. It's definitely um, fun. Definitely fun. A yeah. lot of great people there. Usually 100, 150 people just to kind of get in there, meet some new faces, and you never know. Yeah. You might meet someone in that room that can change your life. 100%. 100%. And I actually, I found out last week that um, I'm going to be speaking at the hospitality show in San Antonio in October as well. Awesome. So, Congratulations. Uh, so, yeah. So, we're coming stateside. Um, so, hopefully, I'll get a chance to, uh, to to test out Southwest and come and see a few a few of you guys who I've been speaking to for the last couple of years online as well, which will be, uh, which will be lots of fun. You're going to do great. They love, they love your experience over there, I'm sure. For sure. This is Steve, as always. Amazing, uh, amazing to chat. Thank you very much for for jumping on a call as well. And uh, yeah, we uh, we should make this more regular and do it again for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hospitality Huddles is brought to you by Auden Hospitality, helping hoteliers to think differently about their F and B to create outlets their guests will love. We've just hit our most downloads ever in a month and that's all because of you so thank you very much for listening to the show if you haven't yet already please press subscribe wherever you might follow your podcasts and it really helps the show if you've got two minutes why don't you leave a review as well because it really helps this to get to more people and the whole aim of this podcast is to really get hoteliers to think differently by listening to some of the best minds in the industry Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.